Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, Don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. This is the word of God for you today. Father, we do pray you'll help us to hear and to understand the truth of your word and apply that truth to our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Davy Gilmore and his wife Tammy never considered calling a doctor when their 15-month-old son Graham became seriously ill. At first it was like the flu, and we didn't think anything of it, Gilmore said. We did what we were taught to do. We prayed. But the flu-like symptoms lingered for a week. And Graham's temperature climbed. The couple did not know that their son had meningitis, a dangerous inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. My mother heard Graham was sick and came down to see him, Gilmore said. She must have realized something was seriously wrong because a couple of days later, my sister called and said, Davy, I know you're trying to do the right thing, but it won't hurt your faith will it if you let me take the baby to the doctor? Gilmore politely refused and then got angry when his sister asked him if his son could hear. I told her, of course he can hear me. What kind of question is that? Gilmore said. He said I hung up on her, walked over to the couch where Graham was lying, snapped my fingers beside his head. He just looked straight ahead and never moved. I clapped my hands and started yelling and jumping up and down, and he kept looking off into space. He couldn't hear me. He was deaf. My mother must have known his fever was so high. Even then, Gilmore said, neither he nor his wife became worried. They called a fellow member of Faith Assembly who reassured them that the deafness was only a lie of the devil testing their faith. The friend urged them to take the baby and their older son, Faith, away for a few days. We checked into a Holiday Inn in Goshen, Indiana, and were all set to go swimming when Tammy, my wife, called me back to the room saying, he can't see now, he can't even see. She was right. Graham had become blind. Gilmore packed up the family and drove back to their home in rural Manchester, Indiana, 110 miles southeast of Chicago. Although they were upset, Gilmore and his wife still had faith. They refused to call a doctor and continued to pray over their blind and deaf infant son for another week while his jaw muscles locked and his neck swelled. Then on the following Sunday, we went to church in the morning and again at night, Gilmore said, we took Graham. That's the weird thing. They believe that if your child is sick and you pray for him, he is already healed. So he really isn't sick, even though he appears to be. Graham said Pastor Freeman gave a particularly rousing sermon about faith that night, and he and his wife returned home feeling better. Their feelings rose even higher when Graham, who was still nursing when he became ill, ate a little cereal. We were soaring when we went to bed, Gilmore said. Then in the morning when we got up, Graham was blue. He was stiff. He was dead. Davy and Tammy Gilmore were both 21 years old and confused. Assembly members believe that the same power that heals the sick also raises the dead. So Davy and Tammy Gilmore decided to take their faith one step farther and pray for the resurrection of their son. They got down at the foot of the bed, Gilmore said, And after 15 minutes of prayer, I just knew I couldn't go on one more minute. 
I look back on it now and realize I was just gone. I was lost. Gilmore said their son's death tore the heart out of his wife. The worst came, he said, when they asked a doctor if Graham's condition might have been treated. The doctor told us that it was a type of meningitis that could have been easily cured if we had gone to him early enough. Many of you may have read that story or seen the movie about that. The subject today is a sensitive one. It is a controversial one. It is one of the most hotly debated uh, subjects in all of Christendom. There is so much confusion over this issue, so many competing voices. There seems to always be a faith healer holding services somewhere. There are faith healers on television. There are other types of healers all around us. Are they for real? Are they, are they all phony? How can we evaluate? Can all these questions be answered in one sermon? We're in this series we're calling A Portrait of Jesus. Uh, we looked at Jesus, the blue-collar carpenter, Jesus, the master teacher, and this week we're talking about Dr. Jesus, the master healer the great physician. I, I, I believe firmly that the best place to start getting a biblical perspective on healing is to look first at Jesus, who is the master healer, the great physician. Last week we looked at Jesus' teaching ministry. Multitudes of people would, would gather in hopes of hearing a sermon from, from him. Remember how the crowds were amazed at Jesus' authority, his, his practicality, and his wisdom. Now in contrast to that, more often than not, in Jesus' healing ministry, we see the flip side of the character and personality of Jesus in the sense that we see the very gentle, personal, sensitive, ever-caring side of the Savior. We see him go on one-to-one -one, one -one with, with uh, ailing and broken people. Some have called Jesus at his best, although how could Jesus be anything but his best all the time? I'd like to encourage you to do a, a personal Bible study in these days before Lent. Read the Gospel of Luke from the beginning to the end and keep a little chart about all the times when Jesus went one-on-one -on -one with someone who was sick. Uh, take careful note of everything that's going on in those little episodes. Try to note the details, wh where it happened, what came before it, what came after it. And I think it will be one of the richest Bible studies that you have ever gone through. Allow me to look at our text once again, one of those episodes, to give you a flavor of this kind of study. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone but go show yourself to the priest to, to verify your healing. Now if you read a little episode like that, you are so tempted, aren't you, to say, well, I understand exactly what's going on. Let me go on to the next episode. But look at this a little closer, read between the lines. Try to read exactly what's really going on. Catch the drama of this event. Here's a man with the horribly disfiguring uh, and deadly disease of leprosy. The flesh is eaten away and, and fingers, toes, feet, hands fall off. Parts of the face fall off. It's a horrible disease. It, it's a treatable disease today uh, if treatment is available for its victims. And I'm, I'm happy to say that I, I believe almost totally leprosy has been eradicated in the Philippines due to the work of people within our own church and others uh, in the community, uh, the leprosy mission. Um, I know people here who work with lepers, lepers or have, and, and those in Thailand. But in that day, it carried a terrible uh, social stigma. There was a great fear of contagion. People who had the disease had to leave their families and, and go live in leper camps, alienated by society. They could beg by the side of the road as long as they didn't um, uh, let anybody come near them. They had to keep their distance from people. And if anyone happened to venture near, they were required to shout out, unclean, unclean. 
Well, this man with that humiliating, debilitating disease went right up to Jesus, which in itself is interesting. He falls flat on his face in front of Jesus as if to say, you are my only hope. I'm giving you honor. I'm pouring my heart out to you. I'm here with my face in the dirt. And, And then he does not make a presumptuous statement. He says, Lord, interesting. If you are willing, interesting, you can make me clean. In other words, uh, I have no doubts about your power. Your reputation precedes you. Lord, if you were willing, would you look kindly on someone like me? If you were willing, I know you can heal me. Jesus stretched out his hand, again, interesting, and he touched him. It seems that Jesus reached down to the man in the dirt uh, to have him get up, maybe look look him eye to eye. All right, you've bowed to me, now get up, friend, and and look me in the eye. You know I am willing. And and he touched him, which was completely unconventional and unnecessary. Uh, The God who thrust the stars into space by the word of his mouth could certainly have relieved this man's illness by a spoken word. And he was saying, I don't care how heinous your condition is. And he touched him, maybe even embraced him. And if you have ever seen a person with advanced leprosy as as I have, the, the thought of touching or embracing them can be sickening. It shouldn't be today, however. It didn't stop Jesus. We read, he touched him and he said, I am willing, and immediately the leprosy left him. That little episode, I I could go on and on. It has so many little uh, details uh, and things in it that that you can contemplate on and meditate on um, and learn more about the character of Jesus, the great physician. In other episodes, you will note other little details. Uh, In one episode, Jesus was in a crowd and someone came up to, to Jesus and we read just a little phrase there. It says, and Jesus took the person off to the side. What's going on there? Jesus doesn't want to make a spectacle. Here is a person who is already humiliated to be in the presence of healthy uh, people, embarrassed. And what does Jesus do? Four to 5,000 people are gathered to hear him speak. And what does he do? He takes the sick person off, maybe behind a rock or a bush or a tree. A little one-on-one time so as not to embarrass the person. He shows personalized attention. And after he he brought a little girl back to life, he said to her her mother and father, now feed her. I'm sure she's hungry. Oftentimes, when people came to Jesus and wanted to be healed, Jesus would begin the conversation by saying, what's your name? People would come up obviously crippled, and Jesus would say, what's your name? And, And he'd say, what would you like me to do? What was he saying? Let's talk. Let's not make this a hit and run affair. Let's talk first. You tell me about yourself. And we read that Jesus said to this man, be clean. No fanfare, no theatrics. Then he ordered him to go to the priest and uh, certify his healing. And if you undertake a serious study of the healings of Jesus, you will probably come to a few basic observations as I have over the years. And I want to just list a few of these for you today. A few observations that typify Jesus' healing ministry. First of all, Uh, Jesus' healing ministry was second only to his teaching ministry, and often he seemed to value healing ministry with equal importance as his teaching ministry. You see, Jesus was concerned about the body as well as the soul of a person. Secondly, nowhere is the compassion of Jesus more evident than in his healing ministry. Love and concern and compassion ooze from the recorded episodes of healing in the Gospels. And thirdly, Jesus healed for the sake of the afflicted instead of for the applause of the onlookers. There was a a dignity about the way Jesus healed people. He didn't make a spectacle out of it. Uh, Quite often he told them, don't tell anyone who healed you. It was enough for Jesus to have a person's suffering relieved. And fourthly, when credit was given, it was always directed heavenward. He would often say, now go and glorify my Father in heaven. And when he said that for them, for them to, uh, to t- when he said for them to tell, it was always, go and tell other people how my Father has had mercy on you. 
Now, I mention these things just to give a, a little summary to the healing ministry of Jesus, but also to serve as a contrast between the healing ministry of Jesus and the healing ministries that we so often see today. Now, I, I want to do a little sidebar uh, now. Not exactly chasing a rabbit, still on the subject, but I, I need to tell you right now that what you're going to be hearing um, uh, is a lot of human opinion. I, I always want to make it very clear when I, when I do this in a message so that you, you know what is the revealed Word of God. Like when I say, here's what the Bible, the Word of God says, that is not my opinion. God's Word flat out says that, and we're told to hold that in high esteem and to obey it. But from time to time, I do make my own observations, and I'm going to do that now. These are my own opinions, but they are uh, uh, studied opinions. I've given a lot of thought to this stuff, and, and, and I just offer these thoughts for your consideration. You, you don't have to agree with these opinions, but I would ask that you at least consider them. Most healing ministries today, I, I feel, can be put into one of two categories. The first category of healing ministries I call the sensationalist. The second category I call the confessionalist. First of all, the sensationalist. The sensationalists are so different from the model of Jesus. Uh, if you see them on television, the conclusion you will reach, if, if you do your Luke study, is that these healers are almost completely opposite in their style from the style of Jesus. Uh, here's Jesus. He's compassionate. He's personal. He likes to do things in private. He, he does it all for the sake of the afflicted. He gives all the credit to the Father. In stark contrast to that, most of the modern media healer types who fit the category of sensationalist happen to be strangely impersonal, not bothering with names and background information. I, I remember uh, so many times hearing, I, I don't know if they still do it, but uh, healers involved in mail order healing. Uh, you send in for a cloth that's been touched by the healer. Send in $30 and you'll get this prayer cloth uh, back in the mail. Clutch the cloth tightly while you are praying uh, for your healing and the power implanted in that cloth will flow into your body. Strangely impersonal. They are embarrassingly conscious of lighting and camera angles, rudely public, up in the spotlight. Many of them seem to be deeply concerned uh, uh, and committed to impressing a constituency. Many of them are, are curiously willing to divert a good deal of the credit for the healings uh, their own way, the self-directed credit if the healings take place. And some of you may think I'm being cruel. Listen, I, I'm well aware of the deception going on among the so-called ministries, the financial scams, the, the double lives being lived by, by some who propose to be great healers. And I often wonder how so many people can buy into all of that. But the truth is that many people who are sick are just plain desperate. Uh, they, uh, th they are so desperate they're willing to try almost anything. They, they will watch almost anything. They, they will support almost anyone. And they, they will be willing to, to overlook almost any contrary evidence in hopes of getting healed. And, and I find... Uh, all of the deception and financial improprieties, repulsive and disgusting. Many reports indicate that few, if any, of the healings that take place by the sensationalist are ever verified by doctors. And what hurts so much is that it seems to be happening at the expense of people who are afflicted and, and who are desperately searching and longing for healing. Be on guard against the sensationalist. Now, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the, the man who came up to uh, the healer one day and said, would, Pastor, would you pray for my, for my hearing? And the pastor said, yes, of course. And so he laid his hands on his head and he prayed this fervent prayer and he released him. He said, now, how, how's your hearing now? And the man said, I don't know. It's not until Tuesday. <laughs> okay, um... First service didn't get that. Okay, um, <clears throat> just, just want to let you know, you're obviously brighter, better sense of humor. Okay. The, the next group is the sensationalist, uh, the confessionalist, excuse me, the confessionalist. And without going into a lot of detail, the confessionalists teach that it is 
always God's direct and perfect and immediate will that all afflicted people be healed. All God is waiting for is for the afflicted person to demonstrate enough faith. And so these afflicted people are encouraged to, in, to um, confess their faith verbally. It's called uh, confessional theology in many circles. And, and they are to say the word of faith, and they are encouraged to do this by the leaders of this movement. And even though they, they know they are sick, they are told to say, I've been healed, I'm in great health, I have a restored body because of the power of Jesus Christ. And the leaders encourage these people to, uh, to say it again and again and again, and, and they believe that if they say it, confess it enough times, they will believe it, and in believing, they will receive the healing. As you might expect, I have all kinds of problems with the confessionalist. Is it always and in every case God's direct and immediate and perfect will to heal every illness? What about the Apostle Paul? In 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I had a messenger from Satan afflict my flesh. And Paul pleads again and again and again. And finally God says to Paul, stop pleading. My grace is sufficient for you. What's he saying? He's saying, you're not going to be healed, Paul. It's not my direct, perfect, and immediate will for you to have that thorn in your flesh removed. My grace is sufficient for you. I have reasons for not healing you. Is healing always directly related to the amount of someone's faith? I can't buy that. Are you going to tell me that Paul, probably one of those uh, outstanding Christians to ever live, that Paul didn't have enough faith and that he was turned down on the basis of his lack of faith? I don't think so. God even used Paul to heal other people. It, it wasn't a matter of a lack of faith on his part. Is it honest even to go around saying, I've been healed, I've been healed, when you know you haven't been healed? confessionalists have a, a manipulative tone about them. And they say, say this, claim this, and then God must do this. That's not faith, that's presumption. That's obligating God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to try to obligate God to anything. I don't obligate God for my next breath of air. I say, if by your grace you want to give me another breath, that's your business. Do I deserve another breath of air? Do you? No. I, I don't obligate God for anything. Confessionalists also manage to convince people that they have, uh, have to buy more uh, recordings, uh, attend more meetings, give more money to build uh, more faith because more faith will guarantee your healing. And so it becomes a, a circular system that afflicted people get sucked into and, and they feel like if they could just get to one more meeting, if they, could, if they could just listen to one more recording, if they could just give 10 more dollars, that maybe that will bring them over the hump and, and they'll get enough faith for God to heal them. Be on guard for the sensationalist and the confessionalist. I've seen it happen uh, and it can happens so easily to someone who becomes ill and they're told, if you'll just have enough faith, God will heal you. Do you know what that does to a person? A person who desperately wants to build their faith every day? I mean, they can never measure up. They can never pray enough, never listen to enough recordings, never go to enough meetings, never give enough money, never do enough works of kindness. It defeats them. And nowhere in Scripture are we told that there is a direct proportionate relationship between faith and healing. Now, now, faith is involved in the healing process, admittedly, but there's no guarantee attached to it that if you reach this level of faith in God, it, it, will, it will affect this certain type of healing because God is sovereign and, and God always has the last word. Watch out for those types of healing ministries. There's a third type of person I want to talk about, and for lack of a better term, I want to call them the dispensationalists. Now, there are different kinds of dispensationalists, but I'm applying that term just to this type of healing. Dispensationalists say, healings and miracles are not for this age. 
They, they are not for this particular dispensation of history. Jesus healed, no question, no problem. Uh, the first century apostles and disciples and other leaders, they healed, no problem. Today, no, no more. No more healing, no more miracles today. That time has passed. And there is often this eerie type of fatalism that accompanies uh, this type of thinking. Every, every calamity, every affliction is precisely God's will, and they often say, don't offend God by praying for healing. It is never God's will. Don't, don't risk God's dissatisfaction. Be a good stoic. Grin and bear it. And then, of course, there are the various sects and cults that refuse medical treatment altogether, that forbid blood transfusions. They, they will not be showing up for our blood drive. Um, I, I tell you, this is going to be confusing and controversial. People are all over the map uh, on this subject. But there is, I feel, a clear, balanced, biblical view of how healing ministry should be conducted today. And I want to end this message by talking briefly about what that involves. First of all, let me take, just let me take a quick poll to wake you up, okay? I just want you to raise your hands. I, it won't be embarrassing. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. But uh, just raise your hand if you've ever had a broken bone. Okay, see your hands? Okay. Uh, if you've ever had stitches. Okay. If you've ever had minor surgery. Whew. If you've ever had major surgery, ah, if you've ever had uh, plastic cosmetic surgery, no, no, don't, okay, no, no. <laughs> don't answer that, don't answer that, okay. Listen, my point is this, that many of us who are here today are functioning fine. We are enjoying life. We have, we have experienced supernatural healing, often without giving God an ounce of credit for it. God still heals today, and occasionally he uses what we call the natural process of healing. But it, it's nonetheless miraculous. We experience it all the time, like a, a cut on the hand or on the face. It heals naturally. Jesus does that. God heals today. Some of you are aware of, are aware of that. God heals through natural means. Give God credit for that. Give God glory if he chooses to heal naturally. It's all supernatural, of course, isn't it? Secondly, God often chooses to heal through the hands and skill of doctors. Medical healing. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and Acts, was a physician. Uh, doctors were trained in practicing in those days, and there was nothing in Scripture that would prohibit us from going to see doctors. Uh, the Bible applauds the gaining of, of wisdom and the discovery of new insights. I, I, I'll, I have to wrestle with the cloning and stem cell thing later, <clears throat> another time. But one of the most frequent ways that God chooses to heal today is through medical means. Polio, tuberculosis, leprosy, so many deadly diseases even today are almost things of the past. God has graciously allowed for them to almost, be almost eradicated from society through medical means. And so many of you could probably stand up right now and say, God heal me through medical means, right? And, and we should pray and we should seek the best medical care possible because uh, God may indeed be planning to heal us through those means. And thirdly, when it seems those two don't work, the natural healing and the medical healing, sometimes, sometimes God heals through direct healing, miraculously. God simply decided at some point to remove an illness, to straighten a limb, to, to strengthen a heart, to, to cure a cancer. God does that. Two years ago, several years now, actually, when we were here in the 90s, our, our daughter's lung collapsed twice. And Darlene then rushed halfway around the world to go to be with her. This entire church was praying for her at that time. She was on the gurney, ready to enter the operating room, already sedated, already knocked out, when one of the doctors said, let's just check this one more time. And it was healed. Just like that. 
He couldn't explain it. He thought it was a miracle. She could have died. She will someday. We're all going to die someday. All healing is only temporary, isn't it? But that lung reinflated. And I have no doubt that God did that. If God wrote the music for all of life, can he not improvise at times if he chooses? Of course, he can and he does. And, and he gives us a process for how we should seek healing. And if you read James chapter 5, how we are to do it. Let me summarize. He says the afflicted person should call uh, for the elders of the church. Now, an elder is, uh, by the way, simply a person who is recognized as being spiritually mature, recognized by the church and other leaders. And it says there should be the confession of sin by, all, by everyone involved. Uh, there should also be the anointing of oil, which is simply the, uh, the symbol of the operation of the Holy Spirit. And there should be prayer. And we are told that, that the prayer of righteous people is powerful and effective. Now, that's the method by which God chooses for his people to seek supernatural healing. I've participated in that on a number of occasions. And we've seen incredible things happen. We don't report those in the bulletin. Uh, Jesus didn't call attention to his healing ministry, and so we don't either. But I need to close, but before I do, I need to clear one more thing up. Sometimes God heals through natural means. Sometimes God heals through medical means. Sometimes uh, through a direct touch after prayer. And sometimes God says no to healing. And you have to know that. He said no to Paul. He, he has said no to thousands of others throughout history. And you ask, why would an all-loving, all-powerful God say no to the healing of an afflicted person? And, and I think the best answer to that we find in Isaiah 55, 8, where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Many of you probably know of or remember the story of Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, a young woman who dove into a lake and struck her head on a rock and uh, has been paralyzed ever since from the neck down. She was athletic. She was a keyboard musician. She, she had everything going for her, and now for almost all of her life, she's been confined to a wheelchair. You may have seen the movie about her life called Johnny, um, and she's written many books. She makes the rounds today as an inspirational speaker. And I've had the privilege of hearing her uh, several times. And Johnny says that she used to pray so fervently, God, why don't you heal me? Everyone knows that I'm afflicted, that I'm paralyzed. Wouldn't it give you glory if you could raise me up and get me out of this wheelchair and everybody would know that you did that and everybody would honor you. It would be such a miracle. Why don't you do that? And she said, God answered her back through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. And, he, and she came to believe that God was very clearly saying to her, I'm doing a bigger miracle. A bigger miracle is for you to get out of bed every day and have someone help you into that wheelchair and for you to smile and worship and teach others how to smile and worship in spite of their afflictions. What's the bigger miracle, God said to her? Um, a one-time healing or an everyday manifestation of grace? And an everyday exhibition of love and joy and peace and satisfaction in life in spite of the crippling paralysis? What's the greater miracle? God may choose to heal you now or at a time of specific need. God may choose to say no to your healing. But Scripture teaches that in either instance, we ought to worship Him anyway. We ought to rejoice, be grateful, let Him use us, work through us, whether He heals us or not, because He is Lord. Amen.